Okay, who's ready for dragons? <laughs> if you're not, next room open. <laughs> okay, so everybody loves dragons. I've been loving them for a very long time. When they're not burning. When they're not the countryside. <laughs> um, myths of dragons have been around roughly 6,000 years, and we're going to talk about them. We're going to start by introducing these awesome, lovely people up here. Hey, I'm Rebecca Kinnear, and yeah, <laughs> hi. I'm Rebecca Kinnear, and I write um, paranormal romance, urban fantasy, sci-fi, steampunk, just about anything that has something cool and different in it. And that's it. I love dragons. I'm Scott Savage, and I am the author of the Far World uh, Middle Grade Fantasy series and the Case File 13 series, and also the new Mysteries of Code uh, Steampunk Dragon series. That first book came out uh, last fall, and the second book comes out this fall. And I'm Holly Anderson, and I write um, young adult urban fantasy, which does include a dragon in the last two books. And I'm Daniel Swenson. I'm actually standing in for Paul Jess, and uh, I'm the founder and creator of Dungeon Crawlers Radio, as well as I finished my first novel and a recent short story that's going to be published later uh, this year. And, and Paul made big, big promises about you, so all right. <laughs> don't let us down. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I'm Charlie Bolsar. I'm the moderator today. And I write science fiction, fantasy. I also do have dragons in my science fiction and fantasy genre blends. So I've got genetically engineered dragons. I also am an artist and I do cardboard art. Is that weird like that? Amazing yeah. cardboard art. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've got a couple dragons. Um, I don't want you guys to float past here when we're ending. This will be in Elm along with other ones so you can look at them there. Um, I also do a, a Velociraptor impression, and I usually <laughs> like to start off with that if the panelists are okay with it, because <laughs> it, it breaks the ice and kind of yeah. warms up the audience, so you guys have to realize how weird we are as writers. I need a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> that hand went up first. Are you going to bite it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Medics are on standby. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that came from 
the people finding dinosaur bones and not knowing where they came from, or um, crocodiles or monitor lizards that they've seen for the first time, they're humongous, or even um, I read where one thought that maybe some people had seen whale bones and didn't know that they came from the sea, and so out of their imaginations, they, they made up dragons <laughs> to, to make sense out of these things. But. I like your comment about how early on, especially, they were primarily good luck charms, and it was a really positive thing. And then you suddenly had that twist to where, you know, dragons were these dangerous, demonic, evil things, which is what really makes it fun as an author, because one of the first questions you have to ask yourself when you're writing is, am I, am I going with dragons being bad or dragons being good, you know? Um, so I think that was a, an interesting change. You don't see as much, you know, it isn't like at a certain point unicorns suddenly, you know, became evil killers, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they are, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, um, a lot of scientists are still arguing over what actually is the source of, of the mist, and it really comes down to a lot of different combinations of things. They didn't mention the fossils. Um, there's also comets and meteors, which people didn't understand. You see just this flaming thing <coughs> across the sky, and you assume that something spit that out, something shot that, something did that, or there been a few really, really horrendous meteorites that they, they I'm, I'm a real huge nerd, just in case you didn't know, <laughs> but uh, there are some, some comets that, and meteorites that become <coughs> balls and then explode just before they hit the ground, and so they cause huge devastation, knocking down trees for miles, and imagine trying to explain that in a world before we understood stellar physics and things like that. You just come across this field that's just desolate, ash and fire everywhere, and you just assume something did this. And so these myths start building up and, and growing. And it's actually really cool that we get to now toy with these myths and, and make them into our own in many ways. Um, let's talk about different types of dragons. What are some of your favorite types of dragons? Um, you know, there's a lot of great dragons in movies and in um, lore and in all kinds of stuff. I really like um, Chinese dragons a lot. I like the Asian dragons. I think they're amazing. Um, one of my favorites is from Spirited Away, Haku. He's, he really stuck out because he was so different from what we'd seen in the past, you know, 10, 20 years for what dragons were. Um, I think going back to those kind of old myths of what dragons were, um, the good dragons are, you know, again with um, dragon heart, where the hearts were so pure. Um, I really like those kind of myths for dragons. Now I have dragons in two of my series. One, he's in my other world or series. He's a baby who thinks he's an adult, and Sam is ridiculous. He is a mixture of my dog and my my seven-year-old son, so <laughs> he just says whatever comes out of his mouth. So he's, he's my fun dragon, and then I have dragon shifters in my fairy elf series that aren't quite as nice. Um, so I think, I like, I, like good, I like dragons that have a lot of personality, um, and I like the original myths, especially the, the Chinese myths of luck and good fortune, and um, because you don't see that very much anymore. You don't see a lot of people who, who take that spin on them more. A lot, like a lot of the paranormal creatures, they've been changed so much from what they originally were. <coughs> I'm also a big fan of Falcor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I grew up reading a lot about books that had dragons. I think the first book I read, I was eight or so, that had a dragon in it. And I remember being fascinated with something that terrifying, powerful, beautiful, all combined in one, and then Falcor blew me away because I had no idea that you could do a sweet, gentle, fluffy dragon <laughs> that you now get to ride in Germany right now. It's pretty awesome. Um, but uh, I am a big fan of the, the teeth and claws and wings and the less gentle dragons myself. 
uh, I, I like them to be fire breathing and biting and growling and deep rumbling dragons. And I think that's one of the most fascinating things about dragons is that there's so many directions you can go. Um, I wrote a, uh, was part of a, a book called True Heroes that if you guys haven't seen it, it's um, an author, Jonathan, Jonathan Diaz, who got together with families of, of kids who were fighting cancer and said, what, what is your, you know, what, what's your dream? What do you want to be? And, and it was, I mean, there were everything from cooks to football players, and you might have seen where they had one boy who got to actually go play with the jazz and everything like that, you know, this kind of thing. Well, the, the boy that I did, William, he wanted to write a dragon. And so I'm kind of going all through the different possibilities of how do I write this? Well, when I called him up, I'm like, you know, so, you know, how do you want to write this? Do you want to, you know? And the first thing he said was, he's like, I don't want to fight the dragon. I just want to ride the dragon. <laughs> and he was really clear. I love dragons, you know? I, I, I don't want anything bad. And so it was an interesting story to write how he ended up doing that for that short story. But, but if you take a look at, at again, and I think it goes back to that mythology of that good versus bad dragons. There's all kinds of ranges in between. And then looking at something like from a, from a, a younger standpoint, like how to train your dragon, where we start out with all dragons are bad. And not only are all dragons bad, but there's all kinds of cool dragons. I mean, you know, they can do lots of things. I don't know a lot of, of creatures where you can have that, that level of, of range, you know? I mean, do they blow acid? Do they blow fire? You know, are they, are they small, fast? You know, how are they scaled and all those kinds of things? And then you combine with it the intelligence of dragons, which I don't know if that's always the case, but it seems like a vast majority of the time, if there are dragons in stories, dragons are incredibly wise and intelligent. Now, they can, that can be for, for good or bad. And so I think that's one of the really fun things about dragons. And, and I, I have to be really careful with, with my series because there's some, some spoilers that I don't want to give away. But I will say that the, that the, the pitch concept was steampunk plus dragons. And that wasn't something that I came up with. In fact, it wasn't even necessarily something that the publisher came up with right away. It, it was a story about these kids who, who build this steam-powered dragon and discover why they're building a dragon and everything. But the first time they did a, uh, a conference, everyone kept coming up and going, wow, steampunk plus dragons. That's just like, it's like, you know, peanut butter and chocolate, you know? And so that's what they put on all their backpacks and everything like that. And, and you don't really discover until you do something like that how huge the fan base of, of dragons is, you know, that, that, that there are just, you know, I, I, again, I don't know of any single one creature that, that has that kind of incredible fan base. So that, for me, that was one of the intriguing parts about dragons was all the different directions you can go with them. Um, I like Mulan's dragon. <laughs> because he's fun. <laughs> um, my dragon, um, that's in my novels is uh, kind of indifferent. You know, I write urban fantasy, so it's in our world. Um, and she's just been kind of hibernating for hundreds of hundreds of years, and so she's just like, eh, humans, whatever. <laughs> but then she she grows with with um, the characters and uh, ends up at first being their enemy, kind of kind of maybe helping them out. But so I, I think. Um, I think you guys are right, you can go so many places with dragons that you have any personality you want. And um, I haven't read about a dragon that I haven't liked. So, <laughs> even, even the fiery, evil, mean, mean ones, I just think they're awesome. So I, I just want to say, because you mentioned Falcor, I just recently let my kids watch The Never Ending Story for the very first time. My two-year-old walks up and goes, puppy dragon. <laughs> and that's all she calls me. Um, but dragons are amazing, and we do have a different that have now been introduced, I mean, especially with D&D coming into fruition, we got you know, fire breathing, we got lightning, we got acid, we've got coal, all these other things. I really love the evil dragons. The eviler, the better. You know, they have a huge ego, they have a, they, they're greedy, they're powerful, and it's, it's a huge obstacle to overcome, especially in writing or gaming or anything like that. Um, so when I wrote my novel, I did pick a dragon, and the fun thing was to go back and you know, in the area I wrote, I wrote in Ireland, there were so, so many myths and legends that I could use and twist to my own purpose. And they're just, I mean, you can just go on the internet and say, oh, let's see what myths there are of dragons in India. And you 
just get a plethora of stories that you can use to twist around. And because of that, I mean, you know, if whether you like good dragons or evil dragons, there's plenty out there. But I mean, honestly, the more evil, the better for me. And I do like the four legged dragons rather than the snake like ones. Oh, yeah. Because I don't like four snakes. Legs. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, bringing up the, the legs, um, <laughs> dragons are pretty diverse. Like, you, you right. talked about Indian dragons and Chinese dragons and Japanese dragons, and they all have different numbers of legs, which is kind of a little crazy that you can have zero. Those well, are snake things that curl around you and are terrifying. <laughs> and and then there are ones that have two legs, like Trogdor, with a beefy little arm, and uh, T Rex, four <laughs> little arms. Then there are the Chinese dragons get interesting because you have three sometimes, or five, and so you, you can definitely play with your dragons. They don't need to be exactly the four-legged dragons that, that we're used to seeing when you write about them. You can totally make them your own. So let's talk about, does anybody know any of the myths, like the different cultures and how some of those dragons are different? so long and, and studied my monster manuals and, and you know playing gaming and stuff like that um so no i don't know from the different myths i i those are the kinds that i usually use because there's such you know i write vampires and i write werewolves and i write zombies and i write but dragons you can do just about anything you want with if you pull a myth because like you were saying they are so varied there's so many different types i mean a werewolf can only shift so many different ways but a dragon can be so many different levels. You can have it, you know, from abilities to intelligence to everything is, you can make it your own. And that's what I think is so amazing about this creature. And, and I will say that um, from, a, from a cultural standpoint, one of the interesting things, again, is as an author, uh, I, I don't know if everyone does this, but, but if I'm gonna go write about a, a mythological creature, I wanna do a lot of research. When I did my case file series, which was for younger kids, you know, if I want to write about zombies, I, I want to really research zombies and, you know, what's there. If I write about doppelgangers, you know, what, what's there as well. And one of the things that I did discover as I was doing a lot of dragon research preparing to write was that, like you said, you can always go to d and I mean, if you want to find out the facts on any creature, you can flip open, oh, okay, you know, that tells me that, um, which is one source to go. But dragons are an area where... I mean, honestly, if you didn't know they weren't real and you started researching different cultures, not just beliefs, I mean, you're reading them almost as facts there, you know, that, that here's what they are, here's what they do, here's what they cause, here's where they live, you know, and this isn't coming from an E&D manual, this is coming from history. And that's why as an author, there's always that intriguing direction. If you're gonna go about dragons, do you write like you talked about that, the reason that there are all these mythologies is that at one point there really were dragons, you know, and it's just a matter of digging in the right hole before you go, oh my gosh, look, you know, there, there are dragons. So I think that's a really fascinating part of that is, is that in these different cultures, they are written as if they really did exist. They're not written like typical mythology that you would see. I sped up. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, the, the Asian dragons, or the, the serpentine ones, they have they do have four legs. Um, what's really interesting is the Chinese dragons have four toes, where the Japanese only have three. Uh, the Indian dragons are, are are serpents, like much like a cobra. And then we have the Wurpans were actually uh, introduced by the Anglo-Saxons, and then it was actually the English and French that introduced the four-legged uh, dragons um, because they they. So that is a satanic symbol, and that's when they got the goat horn type look and, and so forth. So. I, think, uh, I think I read too where some of the European dragons take on other animal forms. Yeah. Uh, they, they look like a dog or a lion or, or something rather than the reptile, reptile that we're used to. Um, I also like the shape-shifting dragons, like in Fableland. 
It's been years since I read it, but I'm pretty sure he, that dragon turns into a human, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, and the shape changing dragons are also from mythology as well. There, there are dragons that can take human form in, in the myths and legends that you'll, you'll read when you start doing your research. Um, there are dragons that are entirely made of gold, there's dragons with metallic beards, there's dragons that can shoot lightning, there's dragons that remain stone all year long except for one day and then they become live and they swallow the first human that they see and then they turn back to stone. And so there are so many things you can, yeah, like wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> Walking past the statue. And, yeah. <laughs> Done. So, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of things you can play with. Um, and then you get into the water, fire, ice, and the elements that you can play with as well. Um, what are some good examples, great examples, of dragons in stories that you guys have read that you love? Um, there's always an Aragon series. You know, the dragons in there are pretty legendary. I, my favorite dragon of all time will always be Smaug. I just love him. I think he's amazing. And I think Benedict Cumberbatch did the best freaking job <laughs> playing him. Um, I, I really enjoyed them. The How to Train Your Dragon. I read that with my kids. Has anybody read those? How to Train Your Dragon? Not like the movie. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> my kids did not quite enjoy the books as much as they enjoyed the movie. Um, there's there's so many great, um, I love the dragons from the Dragonlance series. I love, um, there's so many amazing dragons out there that are so varied. Um, I can't pick one that, as small as my favorite, but other than that, I can't do that one. I asked the question, I can't really pick one either. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me, going back, kind of that first series that really pulled me in with dragon was the the dragon riders of Kern series you know and just it just totally it's like oh my gosh and just got lost in that world and i think that was the point kind of the conversion point for me i i, I played D, D and everything else you know but but that series was just like oh wow this is so cool and a lot of the the things she brought on it and and the companionship between human and dragons and that kind of thing was was a new thing for me at that time and and and, and there's lots of things now in fact one of the difficulties as an author now is writing something that isn't going to be viewed as a ripoff, you know, it, it, just because so many things have been done, it's like, oh yeah, that's just like so-and-so, or that's, you know, you read all the stuff with like Harry Potter, it's like, well, there was this, 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 and it's like, yeah, that, that's, that's true, you know, I mean, it's very difficult to write anything where at some point you can't find some sort of reference to it, but for me, that was the series that kind of just turned on the light bulb and went, I, I've got to find more dragon books. So. I think, um I like the dragons where you did, did interact with humans as well, just because that's so cool. How you to ride a dragon? <laughs> so yeah, I do, I do like um, Sephira from Aragorn, um, and, and like I said, I like the Eddie Murphy dragon. <laughs> so dragons are great series. Uh, it was an introduction for me for dragons as well that developed my love as well as in the Dragonland series. Uh, Sorry with. Tracy Aikman and Margaret Weiss's Chronicles. Um, you know, and then it went from there. Uh, Bob Salvatore wrote some really great dragons in his series with Ice and Death, as well as the Faces. Um, but, you know, we've got Falcor that we've had. Um, Elliot from Peach Dragon, I'm sure all of us have been with that one. Um, that one was a silly one. Um, you know, uh, there's so many examples. I mean, Smoggy is a great one in literature. Um, the dragon from Dragon Slayer. Uh, for I can't even remember the exact name. Um, so, yeah, there's just so many places, so many opportunities we can get uh, examples from, whether it's in books, whether it's in comics, whether it's in video games, or in movies. Um, it just seems dragon. The, the love of dragons just continues to, to roll out and we just keep absorbing it. How would you build your perfect dragon for your fantasy series. <laughs> I just did that. So, um, first off, I wanted 
I had to decide whether I wanted it to be, you know, my villain or a good guy that was kind of helping out my, my hero, and I immediately went for the villain because that was easy. It was an evil dragon. And then I had to develop because it was set in modern times, a little bit in the future, but how would the dragon interact? What would it be going through in that? Uh, pretty much the dragon was hibernating in a deep sleep. They uncovered it, they came out, and it had to deal with you know, a society that wasn't on horseback with swords and spears. They now have missiles and things like that, and how it had to interact. So I had to think, get the mindset of the dragon, how it would deal with that, what powers it had, um, what strengths and weaknesses it had. You know, and definitely um, the ego was very much in, in play because it, did, it thought it was indestructible until they started throwing you know, rocket-propelled missiles at it and it started taking damage. So uh, there, there's a lot of detail that I had to think of and come up with and how this dragon would react, how it would uh, interact with the people and what it would do. So. Um, my dragon was only supposed to be a little part of my last book, or of my second book. Um, but I liked her so much <laughs> she continued on to the very end um, of the series. But uh, I, I started out, um, I, I already told you I like the four-legged dragon, the claws and fire breathing and all that. So, um, but she had, um, even though she was indifferent to humans, there was one human that kind of caught her attention. And um, so she had some a relationship with the one, one human. Um, the funny thing is, my sister-in-law wanted me to write her into my, one of my books, and so she is the dragon. <laughs> she didn't know this until, it, until the third book. It's a good thing, I love my sister-in-law to death. But my, my, her name is Renee, which is not a good name for a dragon. And my children, when they were younger, couldn't say Renee, so they called her Grenade. <laughs> so she's, we still call her Grenade. So the dragon's name is Grenade. G R R N A D E Grenade. So, so anyway, so so I used her favorite color for for the dragon scales and just kind of went from there. The dripping acid from the teeth. So, <laughs> she she liked it. She just finished reading it because it just came out my third book, but, and she she liked it. She liked being a dragon. So I took a chance. I like that you didn't actually show it to her until it came out. You're like that too late now. You know. <laughs> She wanted to, be, so on my books, I actually use some of my kids on the covers. My publisher was awesome to let me do that. And she said, well, I want to be on this cover if I'm in this book. So there is a little shadow of a dragon on the cover yeah. of my book. She didn't know that was her until after she read it. So in, in my, at least book one, and I, I'm going to give a tiny little spoiler away here, but it, it, in book two, okay, this, this, so it won't be a big spoiler. If you see the cover for book two, which is gonna come out pretty soon, it has these kids on this dragon ship, or dragon shaped airship, which is just awesome. And then in the background, kind of down in the corner, there's a real dragon, okay? So it's a little bit of spoiler for book one. But in book one, you have these kids building a steam powered dragon, and they don't know why, they just, they found these plans and these pieces and everything. And so the first part was actually really building the dragon, what would be involved, how much needs to be controlled, how would it work, just doing tons and tons of research. Now that sounds kind of funny because you know you think, well, okay, how much research can you really do on the likelihood of a, of a metal dragon that could you know get up in the air? But in order to create a suspension of disbelief, you have to do your research, you know? People are willing to say, okay, I'm willing to buy that this steam-powered dragon could really get airborne, but I'm totally not willing to buy this because this would, you know, the legs wouldn't bend that way or whatever, you know? So it's really funny that you can lose that suspension of disbelief with one little thing. And so the first thing was just doing tons of research on types of steam engines that they might have then, how it would work, and then coming back and saying, okay, what are all the different pieces you have to control? And, and that was one of the questions is how many legs are you going to have? And in that particular case, there was no way to do a two-legged dragon because in order to get walking and get up to speed and, and take flight, that would be really difficult to pull off. And then, it was awesome, if you guys know Devin Doherty, who does a bunch of artwork and stuff that's here, he's like, yeah, you know, let me sketch out what that would look like. And he did what looked like a really cool blueprint. And I'm like, oh, that is so, so then we started discussing and figuring out the sizes and how everything would work. And then I'm like, what would look really cool is if we actually turned that into like a full blueprint. And he did, and so, 
um, when I, tomorrow night, or if you see me, I don't have them right now, but I'll, I'll bring them to the signing. I've got a whole bunch of poster size steampunk dragon blueprints that are just really cool, you know? Um, and if you see Devin, you can have him sign them. But, so that was the first thing that I had to go through, was, was figuring out actually building that dragon mechanically, how would everything work, how does the balance work, and that's where you had to do a lot of research. And, you know, I've been looking at videos and everything, just going, okay, how, how do they move and everything? But then the second part is, again, I, I want to be careful not to give away too much, but there, there are real dragons in this world. And so the issue that you had to deal with at that point is where do I, and maybe we'll talk later about where dragons come from. Is that going to be one of the questions or no? Okay. <laughs> well, so, I mean, that's, you take a look and you say, okay, are dragons good or bad? Okay, and if they're smart, why are they smart? And how smart are they, you know? I, I, I mean, honestly, if you have this really incredibly smart dragon, is it really just going to sit in a cave on its gold all the time? I mean, what's it doing in this brain? And so you start to think about that process, and then you start to go with, okay, where did dragons come from? And, and you can come up with really two options, but they've both been done a ton. And one is you could say, all right, there's some sort of magical portal and there's a world where dragons live and they came through that portal. And I'm like, no, that totally doesn't fit the story. And then the other one is you could say, well, dragons did exist, but they've either gone extinct or we just can't see them or whatever. And none of those work for what I needed for my particular story. So it's like, well, I've got to come up with a third option. And especially with steampunk and technology, you start going, well, okay, we're right about the World War II type. And, and, and you start playing with different concepts. And so in the second book that I'm just doing edits on right now, we are outside of this mountain. And now I've got to deal with how do people interact with dragons? Do they, do they worship them? Are they afraid of them? Do dragons kill everything? Have they worked out agreements? You know, because again, they are intelligent. Can they communicate with each other? I mean, that's an interesting thing. I, in, in doing research, I discovered that lizards actually can communicate with each other, okay? Um, certain lizards and stuff to the point that, that they warn each other and, and teach each other things and stuff. And so that's, I think, a big part of when you're doing your dragons. It's kind of like if you do magic or something in a book is if you're just going to throw a dragon in and it's going to be one of a whole bunch of other characters, you can kind of get away with that. But if dragons are going to be an important part of your story or your dungeon or whatever, now you've got to think through that a lot more. You know, there's just so many other pieces than just the physicality of what does the dragon's body look like. I knew that would be a good question for you. <laughs> Thank you. How did you build your dragon? Um, I built mine using genetics. So, <laughs> but uh, my my book does cross the lines of sci-fi and fantasy, there is magic, and so I wanted my dragons to be able to do magic, and I wanted them to have four legs and claws and wings, and to be rideable, but not very comfortable, and so I built my dragon, this is pretty much what my dragons look like, kind of, and uh, it's not cardboard. <laughs> not, anytime it rains, it's not going to work. But uh, I also wanted them to create fire, so I had to scientifically figure out how they create fire, and at least for me, whether it went into the book or not. And so there's little hints of, of how they create fire and how they do magic, and they have scales and iridescent skin and um, crystalline polymer wings and things to make them lightweight so they could actually fly. And so I, I worked really hard on, on building my dragon. I also have to say that, that I'm a decent artist, and Devin is my hero. Like, you guys have to see that blueprint. It's, yeah, mind blowing. Step it on here again. <laughs> oh, there we go. Nice, nice little loose on your shoe. <laughs> I reserve a blueprint. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> so my dragons, the first one is my other worlder series. My other worlder series is not like my other series that I have. Um, I decided I was going to write a story that was just everything that came out of my head 
really my personality and things that I've had to deal with or, you know, weird things that have happened to me in my life. So that's my other World War series. It's about um, a fae who has no magic and she is banished to our world and she's a PI for other worlders here. So when I went to build her, I thought, well, what can I do to really annoy her? What can I make her life just, you know, really, really hard? And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to give her the Chihuahua of Dragons. <laughs> and so Samael Havoc, Lord of Chaos, that's his full name, is her dragon, and he's about three feet, and he just, he causes her all kinds of problems. I really wanted him to be funny because I can't even tell you the kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to plug this. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Have you seen the commercial, the Subaru commercial with the little boy driving the car, and he, has, he drops his groceries, and he gets a parking ticket? Right. That's my son. <laughs> So that commercial is him. Like that stuff you see, that is his personality. So that's Sam. That's the dragon. All that kind of stuff that you see that happens in that. And if you haven't seen it, Google it. You can see it. But that's this dragon. He, she comes home in the very beginning of the first book and her apartment's on fire. <laughs> and she runs in. She's screaming for Sam. Where are you? Where are you? And he just kind of comes out and her, her wear tiger boyfriend puts the couch out. And she's like, what happened? Are you okay? And he's like, it's not a spider. <laughs> <laughs> That's his personality. So I really wanted a dragon who just kind of thinks he's a big dragon, but he's a Mushu. He's a little dragon. And he does whatever he wants because he thinks he's a big dragon. Um, so that was a lot, he's a lot of fun to create. And people who read my series, like the second book just came out um, a couple weeks ago, they love Sam because his personality is so ridiculous. Um, and then my other series, my fairy tale series, is fairy tale retellings. And I knew, obviously, I was going to have dragons in there. And they're dragon shifters. And I think one of the biggest problems I had with them is in one of the books, there's a fight. And there's a fight between the dragons and the vampires and werewolves and some other beings. But when I was creating my dragons, I'm like, these guys are tough. Like, how are you going to kill these dragons or even hurt these dragons? Because if you look at dragons, they they aren't loopy. They're not going to be hurt by a normal, you know, Saul was not hurt by a normal arrow. So I had, that took me about six months just to create that fight scene and make it realistic to where you would believe that they could do something that would get them out of this fight with these dragons. I think that was the hardest thing in creating my dragons. My dragons in that series are controlled by an evil, an evil woman. Um, she controls them and makes them do her bidding. So they had to fight, though they didn't want to. Um, but I had to get my heroes out. Somehow, I had to get them out of the fight. So that, I think, is one of the hardest things for me in creating dragons is finding the weaknesses. Where are you gonna put those little teeny weaknesses so that they aren't impervious to everything, so they are vulnerable, as you do with any villain or any hero or any character in your book. But with dragons, I found it particularly difficult um, just due to the physiology <laughs> and the myths of what dragons are and how they're built and what it takes, um, you know, really to hurt one because they are ancient beings. They are, and you don't live that many years by being wimpy like Sam. I mean, you really have to have some some toughness to you. So that, for me, was the most difficult thing, was giving them some little teeny flaws, little imperfections, um, and making it realistic so that you're not just like, oh, really? They found a magic sword that can suddenly hit a dragon? Because um, I didn't. We have probably about 10-ish minutes left. Yeah, about 10 Um and we could talk forever about dragons. <laughs> Seriously. We can get me started on dragons or quantum mechanics and uh, we'll talk to you all. But uh, we probably want to take some questions from you guys. Go. How would you write a realistic, you know, as realistic as you can get, a fairy tale book? How would you write I think Sharon gave you a perfect example, Mushu. <laughs> he is Mulan's companion through the whole movie. He's there, you know, to pick her up, to give her the pep talk when she needs it, and he even doubts himself. And that's, you know, that's the perfect companion. Someone that's not really sure of himself, but trying to be the big dragon, kind of like him, and but at the same time, there for the hero. 
somebody would have to be invisible if you want them to sit on someone's shoulder without people freaking out a little bit. Um, have to have claws of some sort or gecko like adhesive so we can hang on. No wings? No, I said wings to get out of the ah, situation. Wings? Yeah. That, that would actually would be a really fun thing to play with if you have an invisible dragon that no one else can see and so you have them like weird ticks and, <laughs> and all of a sudden their hair is like flattened because there's a sudden downdraft and people are like, I'm so weird. <laughs> weird things happen to you. And it's always a little bit of a singe hair smell floating around them. So you, you could definitely play with that a lot. Or you just go told the Game of Thrones, you know, and have the, the kid always gets picked on at school until he gets his dragon. <laughs> um, so I've been told by several in the know people that fire breathing dragons are so cliche, ice breathing dragons, acid breathing dragons, they're so cliche you can't do it anymore. So, I mean, what do you, if they can't breathe all those things, what are they supposed to do? Lick it enough? <laughs> Ignore the people in the middle. <laughs> yeah. I, did a, um, I did a fantasy writing class um, this last year. I taught one, and I researched all different kinds of dragons. And let me tell you, there are so many varieties of dragons out there. I think I listed maybe 20 in my class that have all kinds of different things. If you look, you can find stuff out there, dragons, rock dragons, you can find, you know, thunder dragons, you can find all kinds, and you can make them up, but I don't think they're cliche. I think there's a fine line between cliche and what is standard. Like, if you go too far out of the box, I found a lot with paranormal stuff, um, you, you lose your readers because it's too far removed from what they already know. So what you take is you take the base of what is already there and you twist it, you make it new, you make it different, you make it your own. Um, that would be my example. That would be my suggestion. And, and I think it depends on, on what your goal is. Okay, you, you can write. You know, I, there was a, uh, an, a uh, was in that was in that I think it was an agent, might have been an editor, who, like two years ago, was talking about uh, vampire books and saying, you know, you. Basically, you can't do do vampire books anymore. Except we got this YA vampire book that was so incredibly written that when we read it, we were like, "We have to publish this." You know, we we just have to. And so I think that's the thing is, you can go two different sides. You know, you can you can kind of go, okay, this is classic dragon mythology, okay, and and that's fine. It just as you do with fantasy, you can say this is elves and dwarves and everything else, and I'm going to write a different story but in this classic world or I'm going to create my own new fantasy world that has new creatures and everything else like that. So I, I, I don't think there's I don't think there's anything that you can't write if you do it well. I think what you do have to ask yourself as far as gripping readers is because there are so many amazing fantasy stories and because there are so many dragons in these stories is that what are you going to do with your story? What's going to grab my reader? You know, so dragons are a part of it. But, you know, I mean, Jessica Day George wrote Dragon Slippers, you know, and that was just a classical dragon, but a very different take on the story itself. Just to add to that, I mean, you really don't have to have your dragons breathe any weapons. They could just be a giant lizard that just eats things. I mean, <laughs> like the stone age dragon. But um, just, you know, kind of like what Scott was saying, just whatever fits your story is going to be best. It's going to connect with your readers. I mean, if you have a dragon that just vomits all over the place, no one's going to really like that. But someone <laughs> might find it funny. Um, but, you know, just whatever furthers the story along is just go with it. Uh, I don't see why not. Yeah. Like especially if you're dealing with with intelligent dragons, with an intellect close to human, above or below, then they will be subject to a lot of the same psychoses that we are. So you can have them like obsessive compulsion, ADD. You could have them like you have a depressed dragon that that hoards his gold because he's afraid to go outside and he's agoraphobic. So, so yeah, you can definitely, definitely play with it a lot. Do you have a split personality dragon? 
records is gold and then another person only spends it. <laughs> <laughs> consistent to your story, just like with magic or whatever, you know, that's, if you start throwing cool stuff out there, at least inside your head, know how everything works, yeah. know how it's set up and why it is that way, because that's what will lose your reader. Readers will believe anything if you back it up, if, you, if you're, you're sound in your world. If you start to break the own, your own rules that you set, that's when you lose that. we got five minutes. What's the best way to like keep your proportions consistent when you have a dragon? I mean, if you look at someone like Smog, and he's he's massive beyond almost description, but then you've got to, like, how would you best see how he interacts with everything? I mean, like, if it's large to a horse, how is his mouth going to so, like, how would you guys deal with that kind of problem? Well, once again, exactly what, what he said. You have to think about how that is going to affect your world. If you have a monstrous dragon, that doesn't hibernate, that is awake all the time, then you're also going to have a huge lack of sheep and <laughs> small animals within 100 miles of that. So you, you have to build your, your world accordingly and think how will that affect everything in the story. So this is what I did for proportion on my dragon. So um, <coughs> I went to Thanksgiving Point, the dinosaur museum. They have that huge brachiosaurus or brontosaurus is there. And I went and stood up next to the lake and then looked up. I'm like, okay, this is what it's gonna look like if I'm looking up at this massive dragon. And then I had my little two-year-old come stand by it and I'm like, okay, this is what a child is gonna look like compared to this dragon. So that kind of helped me get the proportion in there. Now, you know, if you look at Mushu in, in Mulan, you can see that he's really small. So if you're going for something small, that gives you some reference. So to kind of find something that you can identify that, okay, this is the size of the dragon and then kind of see well, this is how, how tall, much taller it is for me, from a child, and so forth. I mean, you want to get a hamster and put it on there, and that'll give you the proportions. And do your, I mean, do your, your research well. If, if, if your dragon's going to be flying, and it's going to be able to bend down, and someone's going to get on the dragon, you actually have to look at how that's going to work. You know, where are they going to sit? If you're going to have two people, where do the wings sit? Like I said, I had to do that so much. You'll see in the blueprints that when we were playing with that, that, that Devin kept on, well, okay, so how does this fit here? And obviously we've got to have a ladder up here because there's no way they're gonna, you know, and so you, you really kind of have to play with all that. But if you look at videos of, like if, if you decide that your your dragon is more bird-like or more snake-like or, or videos of, of different dinosaurs or things like that, you want to look at the movement and figure out this is the way that my creature moves because there are going to be points where you're gonna to have to decide can my dragon squeeze through that doorway? And if so, how does that work? And what does that do to him? You know, and, and it was even harder in building a mechanical dragon, going, okay, how's, how's it all going to work? But in any dragon, you want to think through that. Okay, we have one question. Go. Um, how are you going to make sure that you're working with majestic five-part dragon? Okay, we have time for one of you to answer. Really massive question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. In mine, she starts. She starts out as like the massive fire-breathing, fighting humans, dragon, but then finds a connection with one of the humans, and so you kind of see her um, her change from that. So there, there has to be something that a catalyst, yeah, to uh, to to make that change in the dragon from the white humans. To, oh, maybe they're not so bad. <laughs> And, and whatever the thing is that makes the change has to be at least as big as the initial motivation. Just like a real character. Yeah. If I have two characters that hate each other and I want them to fall in love, something has to be bigger than what is driving them apart. So what is that? You know, it can't be just, oh, a little, you know what, this is a really nice kid. I'll hang around with you. That, it can't work that way. Okay, I know we missed some questions. Come up and talk to us real quick after or find us in the hallway. We're not that scary. <laughs> Sometimes. Unless we're